clear for launch. And with that, shut down your visors. O2 on and prepare for ignition to O2. Copy that and um Welcome back, I'm Mr. Rushoff. This lesson is the first in this series where we're starting to look at Russia and its former republics. And in this lesson, we're gonna be looking at its physical features and waterways. Now, during the Soviet Union, the USSR consisted of 15 republics. Think of these as essentially as being states. Now, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, each of these republics split into independent countries. Russia was one of these republics. Now, three other republics were the Baltic states of Europe. These are Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, which actually broke away before the Soviet Union actually fell. We find three other Soviet republics in Europe, which are Ukraine, Moldova, and Belarus. However, in this series of lessons, while we will be discussing Russia, we're not going to be focusing on these six countries found in Europe. Instead, we're going to be focusing on the three former republics in Transcaucasia, which are Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. And then we're going to be looking at the five former republics of Central Asia, which are Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. All of these former republics today are independent countries. And while it wasn't a Soviet Republic, in our discussion on Central Asia, I'm going to be including Afghanistan. Now, taken together, the former republics were a huge territory that equaled one-sixth of the land surface area. Put another way, the region spread across 11 separate time zones. Within this region, we find many different landforms and waterways. Starting in Western Russia, we find the North European Plain, which is a stretch of extremely fertile agricultural land that extends from France all the way into Russia. The fertility of the land is caused by loess, which is a wind-blown sediment. Now, then the deposition of this has created a dark-colored soil known as chernozem, which is one of the most fertile soils in the world. Now, due to its value to agriculture, it is in Russia's part of North European plain that we find 75% of Russia's population to include the cities of Moscow and St. Petersburg. Now, flowing through Russia's North European plain, we also find the Volga River. Now, not only is the Volga the longest river in Europe, it is also the most important river to Russia. Four of the 10 largest cities in Russia, to include the capital Moscow, are in the Volga's river basin, making the Volga incredibly vital to Russia's trade. Now, if we continue east, we find the Ural Mountains, which are the mountains that divide Europe and Asia. Everything west of the Urals is in Europe, and everything east is in Asia. Now, while the Urals are not quite as old as the American Appalachian Mountains, at 300 million years old, they are old. They also are about the same height as the Appalachians, rising to an elevation of about 6,200 feet. Now, as we continue eastward crossing the Urals, we are not only in Asia, but we find ourselves in the Siberian Plain. Now, while we find the Arctic tundra in the northern portions of Siberia and the steppe grasslands in the south, one of the distinctive biomes we find in Siberia is the boreal forest. Now, remember, boreal forests are made up of specially adapted coniferous trees that can survive the brutal winters of the subarctic latitudes. The Russian term for these forests is taiga, which literally means land of tiny sticks, and there is a lot of tiny sticks. The taiga of Siberia represents 20% of all the timber land in the world. Now, Siberia is separated into two regions, by the Yenisei River, with the western Siberian plain laying west of the Yenisei, and the central Siberian plain to the east. The Yenisei River is the fifth longest river in the world and is also the largest river that actually flows to the Arctic Ocean. And we find the Arctic Ocean on the northern coast of Russia. Now, one of the sources of the Yenisei River is Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal is significant for several reasons. First of all, it is one of the oldest lakes in the world, dating back 20 to 30 million years ago when two tectonic plates separated, creating a rift valley. Now, when that rift valley was filled with water, Lake Baikal was created. Now, one of the characteristics we find of lakes that are formed by rift valleys is they are extremely deep. And with a depth of over a mile, Lake Baikal is actually the world's deepest lake. And since Lake Baikal is also the sixth largest lake by surface area in the world, it also means that no other lake in the world has as much water. In fact, holding 22% of all the fresh surface water in the world, Lake Baikal has more water than all five of the American Great Lakes. And unlike Lake Bacosh in the Aral Sea, which we'll talk about in a few moments, Lake Bacal is also one of the cleanest lakes in the world, and it is home to over 1,200 different species of plants and animals. Now, the central Siberian plain is bounded by the Yenisei River in the west and the Lena River in the east. The Lena River is the sixth longest river in the world. 
Now, the Lena River also has the distinction of being the boundary between the central Siberian plain and the Russian Far East, which extends to the east to the Pacific Ocean. Now, one part of the Russian Far East is the Kamchatka Peninsula, which is Russia's part of the Ring of Fire. No, 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 not that Ring of Fire, this Ring of Fire. As we've discussed before, the Ring of Fire is the subduction zone that encircles the Pacific Ocean and was created as the Pacific Plate collided with the North American plates as well as the Asian continental plates. And since the Ring of Fire is home to 90% of all the world's earthquakes and 75% of the world's volcanoes, there is a lot of seismic activity in the Kapchaka Peninsula. 120 volcanoes are found on the peninsula and 20 of them are actually still active. In fact, right now, as I'm taping this, the Kluchevskoy volcano is erupting even as I'm speaking. Now, north of the Pacific Ocean, separating Asia from the North America is the Bering Strait. And at its narrowest point of only 53 miles wide, it separates the two continents. It is also over the Bering Strait that 24,000 years ago, the first peoples to come to the Americas crossed when the ocean levels were much lower and the land bridge was exposed. Now, the second region of the Russian republics is Transcaucasia. Spanning the distance between the Black Sea to the west and the Caspian Sea to the east, the Caucasus Mountains divides Europe from Asia. The name Transcaucasia literally means Asia across the Caucasus Mountains. And it includes three countries directly south of these mountains. Those countries are Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, and technically are Asian countries, but politically and culturally, these countries have stronger ties to Europe. In fact, Georgia had even been trying to become a NATO country until the Russian invasion in 2008 ended these prospects. Now, unlike the Aral Mountains, the Caucasus Mountains are significant mountains about the same height as the American Rockies. In fact, Mount Elbers, which is found in the Caucasus Mountains in southern Russia, is the tallest mountain in Europe at 18,510 feet. Now, the Caucasus Mountains should not be confused with the lesser Caucasus Mountains that runs further south through the countries of Armenia or Azerbaijan and the southern portion of Georgia. Now, while these are not as tall as our counterparts that separate Asia and Europe, the lesser Caucasus are actually still rather significant mountains and reach up to about 13,000 feet in elevation. Now, our final region of the former republics is Central Asia, which includes Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. Now, dominating most of Kazakhstan is a grassland steppe. However, in the southwestern portion of Kazakhstan and northwestern Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, we find the Turin Plain, which is made up of two deserts, the Karakum Desert and the Kaizokum Deserts. These steppes and deserts of Central Asia are largely caused by something known as continentality. We've talked about it before. Remember, the continentality is the effect of areas being far from the humidity of the seas. Now, if you look at the map, you see that Kazakhstan and the rest of Central Asia are far from the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and the humidity from the Indian Ocean is largely blocked by the mountain ranges where we find to the south. Now, in between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, we find the planet's worst environmental disaster, the Aral Sea. Once the fourth largest sea in the world, between the 1960s and 2000s, the Aral Sea has lost over 90% of its size. This is traumatic, but what is really sad is that it was fully avoidable. See, beginning in the 1960s, the Soviet Union was trying to increase its agricultural production, and it called for the water from the Sire Diron and the Amu Diron rivers to be diverted to cotton fields in the Turin Plain. But the impact was devastating to the Aral Sea. Without the waters from these rivers replenishing the sea, the waters evaporated. But the problem is even worse. In order to support cotton, melon, and rice production in the Turin Plain, the Soviets used herbicides and pesticides, which are essentially poisons. Now, when it rained, the rainwater swashed these poisons into the Aral Sea, which is called runoff. And the result is that whatever fish were left from the shrinking sea were killed by the toxins that were introduced through runoff. And even worse, when the poisoned water of the Aral Sea evaporated, it deposited these pesticides and herbicides to the lake floor, where the wind would be able to pick it up and move it across Central Asia by wind erosion. Now, once in the air, these poisons were inhaled by the people of Central Asia, even children, which explains why the region has one of the highest infant mortality rates in the world. Now, unfortunately, it hasn't just been the Aral Sea that has had this problem. Lake Baikal is the largest lake in Central Asia, and is also shrinking due to the rivers that are feeding its water has been diverted for agriculture. But to Central Asia is not all steppes and deserts. There is mountains also. The Tian Shan Mountains, which literally means the mountains of heaven, begins in Kyrgyzstan and runs east for 1,700 miles. 
Now, these mountains are for real because the elevations of many of these peaks actually exceed 24,000 feet. And just to the south of the Tin Chain, we find the Pamir Mountains, also known as the Roof of the World, which rise to over 25,000 feet. The Pamir Mountains are at the junction of the Himalayas, the Tian Chains, two other mountain chains in China, and the Hindu Kush Mountains. The Hindu Kush Mountains starts in Pakistan and stretches west into Afghanistan. Now, the name of the Hindu Kush literally means killer of the Hindus due to the dangerous mountain passes we find in this mountain range. Now, just like the Pamir Mountains, the Hindu Kush Mountains are also extremely tall mountains, reaching over 25,000 feet in elevation. Also in Afghanistan, we find the Helmand River, which is found in the southwest portion of the country. Now, the river's banks create one of the few agricultural areas we find in the country. Now, while the physical terrain of these regions makes it difficult for people to live, the region isn't without its resources. The region has large reservoirs of coal, iron ore, and other metals. Now, the region is also a leading producer of oil and natural gas, especially in and around the Caspian Sea, where 9% of all the world's oil and natural gas reserves lie. Lumber is also another key resource we find in this region. Remember, Russia's Siberia is where we find 20% of all the world's timberland. Now, we also see that the region's climate has had an impact upon human settlement and human activity. Due to its latitude and continentality, Russia can have bitterly cold winters. Napoleon and Hitler both learned this the hard way as both of their invasions were turned back by the brutal cold as much as it was turned back by the Russian defenders. The power of the Russian cold earned the Russian winter the nickname General Winter. The northern tundra of Siberia has other challenges, including permafrost. Near the Lena River, permafrost can reach depths of nearly a mile under the tundra surface. This causes problems when the Russians attempt to construct buildings in the northern reaches of Siberia. The problem is if they construct the foundation of their buildings directly on the ground, the heat of the building will melt the permafrost and the cause of the foundation of the rest of the building to become unstable. Now, the solution that has been used by many is to build the structures on pylons and stilts. This provides space between the foundation and the ground, preventing the permafrost from melting. Another adaptation that we'll talk about isn't an adaptation that mankind made due to its physical environment, but rather distance. Due to its size, Russia proved very difficult to manage. This is called distance decay. To overcome this distance decay, in 1891, the Russian Emperor Alexander III directed for a railroad to connect the capital of Moscow to the Pacific port city of Vladivostok. After 15 years of construction, the Trans-Siberian Railroad was completed. Today, the railway is the world's longest railway in the world. All right, so we've laid out the physical features and waterways of the former Russian republics. In our next lesson, we'll examine how the region's geography has impacted its history. But until then, keep on learning.